And um, Dr. Fan, um, I would ask, if, could you please introduce your panel, your distinguished panel of astronomers from the Stewart Observatory, and then uh, launch your great set of talks that we're all here for. Uh, sure, should I share my screen or should I talk on this? If, the, if you like what's slide. on the slide, you can talk on this if you have- uh, Sure, screen. so today there's three of us. Uh, we're all coming from uh, Stewart Observatory at uh, the University of Arizona. Uh, we're gonna talk to you about some of the earliest supermassive black holes that we have discovered in the universe and how do they tell us about um, supermassive black holes and you just heard about the epoch of cosmic ionization uh, and galaxy formation. So I'm a professor at uh, Arizona and I'm happy to share this, these results with two of my, um, the two of my colleagues gonna share this result with you. One of them is uh, um, a, a postdoc Peter Streetman fellow, Dr. Jin Ni Yang, and the other is a NASA Hubble fellow, Dr. Fei Wang, and we're just going to have a trio of uh, presentations of uh, three interesting discoveries that um, our group had made in the last two, three years. So I'm gonna share my screen and here we go. So we're gonna tell, tell you about the earliest supermassive black holes that we have seen so far in the universe. Uh, before I do that, uh, let me just give you a very brief review of sort of the rundown of the 13.7 billion years of the cosmic history, and then zoom in on a part of the cosmic history that um, our research has been focused on. So of course, it all started with the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago, when the universe was filled with hot gas, it was hot and dense. And after about 300,000 years, uh, the Big Bang began to fade away. So you are left over with the afterglow of the Big Bang, which we know of the cosmic microwave background. After that, the universe entered what we now call the cosmic dark ages. It's dark in the sense that the universe has cooled down. Also in the sense there was no light, no stars, no galaxies, no quasars, no black holes formed. So the dark age was the quiet time of the universe that lasted, we don't really know how long, but probably 400 million years or so. And to, at that time, the first light coming from the collapse of the earliest primordial gas cloud uh, began to form stars. So maybe 400 million years after the Big Bang, you have the first galaxies and first quasars and first black holes in the universe. That's sort of the first cosmic light. And these objects not only lit up the universe, but also sort of heat up the intergalactic gas in the universe that we call the era of cosmic dawn uh, or the epoch of ionization that you just, that just heard uh, from one of the world recipient um, earlier. Uh, this process literally transformed the universe from sort of cold and dark to full of hot gas and a lot of light coming from these early galaxies and quasars. Uh, so after the reionization completed, the universe become transparent and dark age ended. Uh, this realization happened somewhere around a little bit less than 1 billion years after the Big Bang. And after that, you have sort of your more normal galaxy evolution for the rest of almost 13 billion years of cosmic history. So the research that we have been doing are focusing on this era, sort of between 500 million years and 1 billion years. That's the epoch of the first light, the epoch of ionization, uh, and the epoch of the highest redshift and the earliest galaxies and quasars. So this plot is another version of plot that is shown before. You have the inflation and Big Bang, the dark age, and then the first stars uh, ended the cosmic dark age. So we're looking at this era in the cosmic history when the universe was a less than 1 billion years. So about six, 7% of, of its current age. So literally when the universe is a baby and we want to know when the first galaxies form, when the first star form, and uh, when the first black holes show up, and whether we really understand how the first galaxies and the first black hole came about. Uh, so this plot just shows you sort of our progress of looking for the most distant galaxies and quasars in the universe. In the 1990s, we only have objects that are six, seven billion years, billion, billion light years uh, distance, or six, seven hundred, six hundred or 7 billion years ago. Uh, and then with things like Hubble, now people can reach to 13 billion light years away. Or if you're familiar with the redshift, it's about seven, or the universe has expanded about eight times since then. Um, that is sort of our cosmic frontier in terms of looking for distant objects. 
uh, this again correspond to uh, when the union was about five six percent of its current age. So instead of a thirteen point seven billion year universe at that time, the universe was sort of eight hundred million years old. And of course, with the later this year, the NASA will launch its uh, next flagship mission in the form of James Webb Space Telescope. That will probably push us further down to when the earliest galaxies and quasars formed. Um, what I'm going to show you now is actually animation of computer animation of this, when this process might happen. Uh, this is a, a simulation uh, that showed essentially is the temperature of the hot gas that began to fill in uh, and in the early universe, again, between about 500 million years and 1 billion years after the Big Bang, you will see that um, essentially the first galaxies begin to emitting light and these light begin to ionize or heat up the larger and larger volume of the observable universe at time until probably after 800, 900 million years after the Big Bang, the universe began to fill with this light coming from early galaxies and filled with this hot ionized bubbles uh, that transform the universe. That's of course what we call cosmic ionization. After that, you begin to see sort of the structure of galaxies uh, that you are more familiar at lower redshift. Of course, among these first light sources, the ones that we are really, really interested in are quasars. So let me remind you what quasars are. Quasars were first discovered um, in mid 1960s, so almost 60 years ago. 60 years ago, uh, quasars are shorthand for quasi-stellar objects or QSOs. Uh, they were discovered as sort of compact stellar-like objects, hence the name. But soon after that, people realized these are not nearly not not just normal stars. Instead, they are extremely distant. They are at billion of light years away or at high redshift. Um, and if you look at the ground-based image, although they look stellar, if you zoom into a high resolution image, whether through adaptive optics or through Hubble Space Telescope, you'll see these are not stars, but they actually are very compact and luminous nuclei at the center of distant galaxies. And they are extremely luminous. Uh, most of the quasars sort of all shine the entire Milky Way galaxy when you put the 100 billion year billion stars in the Milky galaxies together, a quasar can outshine by a hundred or thousand times. So clearly they are powered by something different from your normal nuclear reaction in stellar evolution. Instead, we believe quasars are powered by essentially gas and dust falling, to, falling into very massive black holes with mass ranging from millions to billion solar masses. And of course, even black holes themselves do not emitting light. When you are attracting and accreting these gas and dust into them uh, with a strong gravitational pull from, from the black hole, these gas and dust is going to acquire a very high velocity and essentially rub against each other. And this heating process is actually creating an energy source that is more than even a nuclear reaction and producing these tremendous amount of radiation as right before these hot gas falling into the black hole. And that's why you can see them from far away. That's why they're so bright. So quasars are among the most luminous object and the most distant object you can see in the universe. And they're powered by, again, billions, millions to billions solar mass black hole um, uh, in the early universe. So our goal is to look for extremely distant quasars. As I mentioned, these objects are, power, are powered by billion solar mass black holes sometimes. So they are excellent probes of how black holes form and how the surrounding galaxies around these black holes form assembled in the early universe. And because they are such bright light sources, they're also sources that can actually, because the light has to, have to travel through these 13 billion years until it reaches, sort of lit up the line of sight and try to tell us what's going on in the gas between uh, the quasars and us. Um, so how do we find these distant quasars? Um, the problem of finding them is because they are technologically challenging for two reasons. One is, of course, you're looking at the earliest object in the universe, among the earliest of the universe. So sort of like you're, you're looking at, as an archeology, span looking for the earliest civilization. They're by definition, they are rare. They're not common. So it's not like you look at everywhere a point in a telescope to a bump into a distant quasar. 
instead, you're really literally looking at objects that are only a few objects in the entire observable universe. And that requires us to use sort of the largest sky survey to catch even a small number of them. And in, when you do that, it's essentially a big data, data mining challenge. You have to go through billions of light source uh, uh, measurements in order to find them. But also because they are far away. So even quasars intrinsically very bright, uh, they are faint at large distances. And that means um, we have to combine the largest survey with very deep observations uh, using the largest telescope, both on the ground and in space to study them in detail. So it's a rather elaborate process of how do we look for them? We basically start with a very large imaging database. For example, you've heard of a long digital sky survey and another sky surveys with billions of objects. You're looking, examine their properties, their colors, their morphology and so on. And you write some fast computer programs to, to select them. And then you come up with say a small number, well, not small number, but say thousands of them out of the few billion objects that you looked at that you think may be these decent quasars. And then you go to a larger telescope and try to take their light spectra of these objects. So we went to, for example, the telescope we use or often use are like the Magellan telescope in Chile or the Milton Mirror telescope, MMT telescope in Arizona uh, to identify them, to figure out whether they're really quasars or not. And for the objects that we are actually be able to identify, confirm. Then we go to some of the biggest telescopes in the world uh, and I show you the two pictures. One is the large binocular telescope in Eastern Arizona, which is sort of a two 8.4 meter telescope mounted the same mount. And then we also often go to a CAC telescope in Hawaii to 10 meter telescope to using these biggest tools to study their properties. So you really start with billions of objects, then you end up with handful of these most interesting objects that are the most distant quasars are mark markers of these most uh, massive and earliest supermassive black holes. So we're going to go through sort of three stories of three new discoveries. I'm going to talk about the brightest quasar that we know in the early universe. All our story has a little bit twist in it. Uh, the brightest quasar story is actually it's bright because it's gravitationally lensed. The second story that Dr. Yang is going to tell you is the first known uh, billion solar mass black hole we know in the universe. And we have an interesting twist of how we work with, um, uh, since it's discovered in Hawaii, how we work with the local community and come up with the first name, Hawaii name given to a quasar. And the third is our most recent discovery, which is the most distant quasar yet known um, with a really exciting signature of a highly relativ relativistic outflow from the black hole, the central engine itself that is influencing the galaxy that Dr. Wang is going to talk about. So three brief stories. My story is about the brightest quasar we know in the early universe. So this object is the most luminous quasar that we know within the first say billion years of the cosmic history. So this plot shows you actually is time since Big Bang versus luminosity of quasars, how bright the quasar is. And you can see 13 billion light years away, it's right over here or seven million years after the Big Bang. These are where most of these quasars or supermass black holes are. And these are by no means small objects, right? They are objects with 50, 100 trillion times as bright as the sun. But two years ago in our studies, we bump into this object, which is over there. It's way out there in terms of how bright it is is the most luminous object we have in the early universe, which is 12 point billion light years, eight billion light years away, or a redshift about 6.5. It's really going into the uh, epoch ionization as early as that. It has a luminosity that we observed to be 600 times, 600 trillion times solar luminosity, way brighter than any of the quasar we ever found were in the early universe. Now this object is exciting because it's so bright. So six trillion solar luminosity is really an extraordinary object. Um, if you try to estimate in order to produce the kind of luminosity, the kind of brightness you see in this object, what kind of black hole you need to have it have there? It's 10 billion solar mass black holes. This black hole's mass is about as massive as any black hole we've ever known in the entire universe. Yet I'm talking about these objects coming from really, really early on. 
for comparison, the black hole that we have in the Milky Way is about 3 million solar masses. So it's about 3,000 times bigger than the black hole we have in the Milky Way, yet it's so early in the universe. So how can you form them so quickly, right? Um, the object also is accompanied by a lot of sort of gas and dust emission indicative of uh, star formation around it. And it will be have, have a star formation rate of forming basically 10,000 sun per, per year. And that's also unheard of in terms of how fast can you form stars. By comparison, Milky Way form about uh, one solar mass of star per year. So that will be a huge challenge to how black holes form and how galaxies form in the universe. But there's another way out. Maybe the luminosity we see there is not quite real. Maybe it's not the real luminosity we're looking at. Instead, we, we have no, in fact, that can, uh, can boost the luminosity of, a, of an object called gravitational lensing. In this case, the quasar light could be magnified by a foreground lensing galaxy. And as Einstein tells you that the, the bending of light is actually going to magnify the light to 10 times, 100 times brighter than it usually is. And that will probably explain away why you have such a brighter object in the universe. Except before we study this object, none, no quasar are known uh, to be so far away and yet lensed, even after many years of search. Uh, in this object, we didn't know whether it was lensed or not. We have suspicion. And the initial spectrum of the object shows that maybe there's another object in the spectrum that we could see that could be a signature of an intervening galaxy, this lensing galaxy in the middle. But, and also the gr our ground-based image looks slightly extended. Doesn't quite look like a point source to us. But really, in order to really know what it is, we need Hubble Space Telescope resolution, right? So we did take a picture with Hubble. When you have the Hubble resolution instead of one quasar, now you actually have three images. Two of them are two images of multiply lensed quasar. Um, and one of them, a redder color, because they're high redshift, one of them is a diffuse object just a little bit less than half arc second or point arc second away from these quasars um, is a diffuse galaxy that we think is the lensing galaxy that is bending the light. So what's basically happened is the quasar light get bended and actually split into three different images, except even HST cannot just barely resolving these two and their third image over there, then half arc second away, you see the lensing um, galaxy that is magnified, magnifying the, the light. And this object is actually 50 times brighter than it otherwise ought to be because of the faint lensing source. So this animation just shows you sort of how the light gets bent by this distant quite galaxy, which is about halfway to the quasar, sort of six, seven billion light years away. Uh, and then the Hubble image shows that there are three images of the quasar, and then there's a galaxy right next to it. Even though this object is not as intrinsically bright as we thought it is, it's still extremely interesting because it is the brightest object at cosmic dawn. And that gives us sort of a unique beacon to understand how the gas is distributed between us and quasar because the bright source is gonna shine the light, light through the gas and the gas, cooler gas is going to create absorption um, in the spectrum of the quasar. So we have a 20 hour exposure using the very large telescope in Chile to understand how these gas phase is forming. It's also really an interesting lens. And because of the magnification, in fact, this gives us really a cool opportunity to zoom in because it's magnified everything, right? Zoom into this environment of this supermassive black hole. Still have a very massive black hole in the middle. And observation that we are currently, currently carrying out is actually able to zoom in to only about 150 light years away from the black hole using sort of ELMA observation using radio telescope in Chile. And this 150 light years is well within the, the, the area where the black hole is completely dominating gravitational field. In other words, by analyzing this quasar, we actually can probe exactly what the black hole is in this distant object, again, 13 billion light years away, what the black hole is doing to its surrounding, just like we can do in much closer objects. And this resolution 150 light years out of 13 billion light years is really the power of both the sensitivity of the telescope uh, and the magnification of the lensing that gave us the sort of actual power of the telescope that uh, allow us to study how the black holes are, are, are doing to its environment. 
So that's my story. It's a uh, really bright quasar, but uh, luckily or unluckily, the quasar is actually magnified by a factor of 50 through this graph lensing, in fact. Now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Yang and tell you, tell you a uh, even more massive black hole at even further away. Right. Yeah. So, um, oh, thank you. So, uh, um, today, um, I will talk about the story about this discovery of this uh, Redshift 7.5 quasar. It's a new Redshift 7.5 quasar. So before that, there uh, there was only one quasar about Redshift 7.5. And so what is exciting about this discovery is uh, um, after we discovered it, we found that this black hole is very massive. So we call it monster black hole uh, found in the early universe. So then we can see this picture, this artist's impression of this quasar. And actually, we can see, uh, yeah, this is the whole picture um, as created by German uh, Observatory. So when we published the work last year. Uh, and this quiz again, Hawaii name named Panua Anna. Uh, I will talk about the name later. So um, what is special about this quiz? So uh, this quiz, uh, when we discovered it, is the first known quiz that discovered a redshift about 7.5 that is host, uh, hosting a filling solo mass by hole. So what redshift higher than 7.5 mean? As I mean, at that time, the universe uh, is younger, it's younger than 700 million years. It's just 700 million years after the Big Bang. So it's a very, very young universe. Um, yeah, this is uh, the, the project uh, um, about this quasar. And uh, here we can see the, our team um, uh, working on this project. And uh, the Panuan, uh, the name of the, of the quasar, is given by this program. This is a um, Hawaii program. So uh, because this quasar was first discovered uh, with Germany telescope in Hawaii, so it, it received a Hawaii name. And it's also the first quasar to receive a Hawaii name. And the name is Unseen Spinning Source of Creation Surrounding with Brilliance. So it's a very interesting name and very nice name to this quasar. Um, and now, oh, okay. Uh, then I will talk about um, how we selected this quasar. So this is a quiz. This quiz is a uh, discovery from our uh, um, large scale um, optical near infrared, uh, large scale, uh, large sky um, uh, redshifts. Uh, large sky, sorry, for the redshift higher than seven quasars. So based on the optical and the near infrared uh, public optical near infrared um, wide field photometric data. So this here, this picture show all the maps of the. Uh, sky coverage of this public optical near infrared photometric data that we can see some uh, for this quiz we're using the decals we can see the green region covered by this is the decals and panstar panstar omog um, cover 35% uh, of the whole sky is around uh, north in the northern sky uh, north and minus 30 degree um, and then UHS we can see this is a region bounded with the solid right line and also the wise, wise provide the uh, provide us with the near infrared and the mid infrared photometric data for the whole sky. So um, for this quiz, uh, we use this uh, photometric data and uh, select candidate. Just candidate like this quiz, uh, we have around a few hundred candidates. So uh, we select this candidate uh, based on the photometric imaging, photometric data. Uh, we can see the imaging something like this. So the first the three, uh, this three, uh, one, two, the, the pan star Z, pan star Y, and also the Z, this is uh, from decals. This is the first three is the uh, photometric imaging in the optical. And then we can see the other four that the data from the near infrared. So we can see um, it's very obviously that this quiz is detected in the over near infrared band, but it was not detected in the optical. So we call it optical dropout. It's uh, uh, this such kind of method usually we used to, to um, um, search for high redshift objects like quasar or high redshift galaxies. So for quasar, we can see the bottom panel, there is uh, um, the white solid line show a quasar template uh, for a quasar redshift 7.5. So we uh, compare with this colorful line means the filters it just match this imaging show uh, in the um, upper panel. So we can see the blue, uh, from blue line and to the, uh, this, uh, the, this one, two, three, four, these four uh, filters, uh, they're, from, they're all in the optical. So as I mentioned before, we cannot detect this, uh, this source in the optical, and, uh, but we can see it in the near infrared because it's lamma alpha, high redshift, it's lamma alpha, quasar's lamma alpha emission line moves to redder and redder to the near infrared part that we can see here is uh, um, redder than the one micron here. So this is a, um, 
a basic method, but just basic color. But yes, we will also have some um, additional color cut to improve selection, uh, to improve the efficiency, and then we will get one quasar. So um, after the imaging, we will typically take spectroscopy. So this quasar, as I mentioned, the first, uh, firstly discovered with uh, Germina North. And we can see here's a picture of Germina North on top of Mauna Kea. And we can see also in the middle, uh, there's the, this is the 2D uh, spectral, the 2D imaging of the quasar. Uh, we can see the bright, uh, there is a white line here. This is the, the, the signal, the photons that we get from the quasar from redder, oh, sorry, from redder to bluer wavelengths. And we can, within the red circle, we can see here is a brick. Their brick, just uh, as I showed before here, it's corresponding to the uh, Lamarfa brick here. So we can see blue of the brick, there's uh, nothing, no flux. So that's uh, the, the image we get when we first discovered this quasar. Uh, so this is uh, two years ago. After that, after the first discovery, um, this quasar was also observed with uh, a series of large telescopes. We try to get more information from optical near infrared to some millimeter to the resident far, far infrared to get more information details about this quasar. And we can um, know more about this quasar and also the environment of this quasar at that time. Uh, so we can see this telescope from left to right, there are CAC, Magellan, Alma, Yogurt, and GCMT. So uh, Magellan is in Chile and the other are over uh, in Hawaii. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> Alma is all in Chile. And the other three are, um, in Hawaii on top of Mauna Kea. So, uh, we can see what we can get from this telescope, this observation. So as example here show the upper panel show the spectral. Um, the, the left one, the left panel, which the black line means the observe the spectral. Uh, this is what we can get in the optical, in the near infrared spectral. And then we can see uh, something like the uh, strong emission lines in the two insert panels show the uh, two strong um, emission lines from the quasar that's a very a uh, famous feature from quasars that we can use to to uh, to understand how this quasar, um, how the quasar emit this uh, broad emission lines, and we can uh, measure the, for example, black hole mass. I will talk about later from the uh, strong emission lines, and also we can see uh, the upper right one. That's the C plus line, the fine structure line from Alma. This one's gathered from Alma. That's the uh, emission line from the um, host galaxy. So um, typically uh, people use the, this line, the C plus line to get the uh, most accurate redshift measurement of this system. Uh, so after we get this information, we get spectral, get this emission lines, then we can uh, do some data analysis. So uh, the next part I'll talk about. So what we can learn, what can we learn from this new discovery? Uh, the first thing, as we mentioned before, uh, quasar are very luminous. So uh, with this luminous quasar, we can get to very distant universe. We can look back to very early universe. So the first things we can know is from uh, the uh, luminous quasar, we can learn the environment and of this quasar about the, uh, the intergalactic median. So uh, I will talk about the realization. So as mentioned before, there is, a, uh, there is an epoch called realization just after the dark age, then the first generation of the stars, galaxy or agents started to ionize the surrounding the neutral hydrogen. Then we, we can see them and then this is a, um, the reanalyzing this of the surrounding gas, we call it realization. As also shown in the um, simulation, we can see uh, there are some ionized region and the bubbles as the quasar, we can see our new quasar is one of them and the quasar, the, the UV photons uh, emitted from the quasar uh, start to ionizing the surrounding the neutral uh, IGM. So based on this property from this quasar spectral, then we can um, know more information about the realization, know more about the ionizing fraction and the neutral fraction of the IGM at that time, at, the, at that time uh, surrounding the, the, in the, in the local environment of this quasar. So what we can do is uh, this quasar just, uh, for example, we can use the quasar spectral to estimate, uh, estimate the neutral fraction, uh, neutral hydrogen fraction in the IGM. Uh, what we can do, I can see these, there are two uh, pictures, the upper panel is a simulation. 
um, the solid black line here then is uh, observed, is simulated observed uh, quasi spectral that we can get from our observation. The dotted line is uh, uh, simulated intrinsic spectral. So we can see, uh, so the peak means this uh, quasi landmark emission line. And blue out of the peak, there's some absorption that's absorption from the uh, neutral, uh, neutral hydrogen in the IGM. So what we can learn when the neutral hydrogen is uh, increasing, then we can see some difference of the spectral is changing. It's uh, observation is more and more obvious, it's stronger and stronger. So uh, that we can see is with different neutral fraction here. So with such kind of uh, observed spectral, by comparing the observed spectral and the quasi intrinsic spectral, the, uh, the black solid line and the dotted line, uh, by measuring um, the line profile and uh, uh, estimate the difference between the observed and intrinsic spectral, then we can get the estimate of neutral fraction. So this is from simulation, and we can see the bottom panel is from the observed. So this is the spectral of our uh, quasi pernua and now that we can see the black line here is our observed spectral, the right line, the solid, the right, uh, blue line is the intrinsic spectral. Then we can see the, the gray dotted, uh, the gray dashed line is the Lamarfa uh, emission. Uh, just corresponding to the peak show the upper panel. Uh, so that we can see uh, the difference between the black line and the blue line is the absor absorption features of this quasar. And based on this feature, we can estimate the neutral fraction. So what we can get is just in this figure. Uh, actually, this figure show the neutral fraction of as a function of the redshift. Um, this figure, uh, including most of the redoubts, that's uh, um, the result of the neutral fraction uh, derived from the uh, high redshift quasars, we can see from redshift 5 to redshift 7.5. And they're from uh, many different methods. And this four here above redshift 7, uh, these five quasars here, this blue point here. So we can see uh, these five points are over from the absorption as I showed before, just by comparing the observed to the spectral and the intrinsic spectral, measuring the lamma alpha uh, emission line region to um, characterize the observation and estimate the neutral fraction. Then the red point here with everybody here, this is a result from our new quasar. Uh, so we can see uh, there is a, a very important feature, very important conclusion we can get from this quasar is we can see this one at high right shift, uh, but we can see it's for, uh, has very low uh, neutral fraction. And we also can see uh, this five points have, have very large scatter, so which means uh, the realization precise is not homogeneous. We are looking at a patchy realization. So that's the sky can tell us, uh, the scatter can tell us. And next one, uh, after learn something about the, the IGM, the realization, uh, we can also learn about something about the supermassive black hole. As we mentioned before, uh, each quasar hosts a very massive black hole, a supermassive black hole. And this quasar is, um, um, observed at a very early universe. So we can uh, study the, the formation or the growth of this supermassive black hole at a very early, early, early time. So at a very young uh, universe. Uh, this is uh, two pictures are still the artist's impressions of the seed black hole, the left panel. We can see this is a, a impression of a seed black hole, um, just uh, 100 million years after the Big Bang. And the right panel is our quiz upon you and uh, actually, I should say, uh, so far, uh, astronomer um, uh, still don't, don't know exactly how the how the seed black hole form and uh, uh, what the seed black hole look like, but we still uh, can image that. And also, uh, why we try to uh, why we uh, search for this quasar just try to get more information about how did this super high this supermassive black hole grow or how massive this supermassive are. And also, uh, we try to learn. Uh, how they sit by holes form. So uh, there's a picture that we can see uh, this is a black hole mass and uh, also the time after the Big Bang, we can see uh, here the, uh, the upper right is observed uh, supermassive black hole from high redshift quasars. They're very, very massive, uh, typically it's around the uh, 0.1 um, billion solar mass to 10 billion solar mass. So this is a very massive so black hole there at the right shift uh, uh, above six to 7.5, this around uh, 700 uh, million years after the Big Bang. Then the other side, we can see there are just some, there are some models. Yeah, they're just models. So just theoretical model predicts some um, 
sit by holes. Uh, there are some many three uh, models. And first one we can see that we uh, they have different uh, sit by hole mass and uh, they form uh, at different time. Uh, just for example, we are, um, at early time we can see the stellar remnant uh, that's with less mass around uh, 100 solar mass. And we can later we can see the dense cluster uh, more massive. It's around the 10,000. And uh, even later, we can see even massive uh, seed by hole, we call it direct collapse. So, but the question is um, astronomers currently, we still cannot uh, connect to the observed the supermassive by hole and the theoretical model predict seed by holes. We don't know how they uh, grow. And uh, actually, uh, we don't know how this seed by holes, what the exact time and exact mass of this seed by holes. So uh, what we can learn from new discovery, uh, still back to the spectral. I, as I mentioned before, we can estimate the black hole mass from the spectral. So this is a, a broad emission line from this quasar. Um, we call it maximum two line. So uh, by fitting this line, we can estimate the uh, black hole mass of this quasar. Um, so we um, just do the spectral fitting for this for Ponyo Anna, then we get, oh, uh, that we get is black hole mass. So we finally found this, uh, this quasar has a very um, massive black hole. So we, we can see the, in this figure, this is a supermassive black hole gross tracks. Uh, we can see the redshift from high redshift to low redshift uh, from early time to uh, one big year after the big bang here to later. And this is the black hole mass from less mass to uh, more massive so supermassive black hole. So we can see how here the, the, the right point is some black hole mass of our uh, quasar Ponyo Anna. Uh, we can see here, uh, this is the by hole growth track. So which means here, it means uh, this is a seed by hole. Um, the observe of this new quasar requires a, a massive seed by hole here. Then we compare to uh, different lines, which means this uh, by hole requires the most massive, the most massive seed by hole than any other quasars. Uh, so uh, how massive it should be, um, we can see here, uh, if we go to redshift uh, 30, we need 10,000 solar mass black hole. If we go to redshift 15, then we need uh, 300,000 solar mass black hole. So it's more massive. So um, massive than any other uh, quasar seed by holes um, discovered before this, this quasar. So uh, based on this constraint, uh, what we can learn about the seed by hole. Uh, so we can back to this figure. So as I mentioned before, show some uh, seed by hole models with different seed by hole mass. So this result is more consistent with the di direct collapse by hole seed model. Um, we can see uh, this model provides, is providing more massive seed by hole and it's more um, consistent with our result. Uh, uh, we should know that here, um, we should, we, uh, we still cannot rule out any models, but just uh, the massive uh, supermassive battle di um, discovered from this quasars uh, is more consistent with, with this massive state by hole model. And actually the question is, uh, as I mentioned before, we still cannot rule out the, any models. So uh, the answer is, the exact answer is still un unclear. So how we, uh, what we can do, uh, how to get the answers, that's uh, to discover uh, more supermassive black holes at more uh, even higher redshift. So I think uh, we can hear more about the the, the other quasar that's at higher redshift uh, with even more massive black hole. Now uh, we can just go to Figo's talk. All right, thanks everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the most the most distant quasars we discovered in late 2019, but published uh, early this year. Uh, and uh, here's so the picture made by artist from Norlet. And this is a central supermassive black hole. And uh, here is a acoustic disk, basically some gas. It's, uh, it's accreting around the black hole. And those gas will feed the growth of those black holes. And also those, uh, those black hole will produce some other feedbacks like produce some wind or jet uh, out to the uh, galaxy. And I will talk about this in detail. Uh, okay, so before I talk about this quasar, I wanted to briefly review like uh, how people find a quasar in the like, uh, last 60 years. In the early times, people using the radio technique uh, 
because in the early the quasar were discovered as a radio emission and stellar like object. But soon after that, people noticed that only a small fraction of quasar has radio emission. So not all quasars have radio emission. So you have to use other methods in order to find more quasars. The way the uh, development of the large survey optical imaging, people started to use the optical imaging to find those quasars to discover both quasars with both radio emission and no radio emissions. Uh, but if you want to put, put the even further receipt, uh, those the light from those quasars are re receipted to the infrared, so they are no longer visible in the optical. You have to use the infrared imaging to find those quasars. And in the last 10 years, people have posted to like receive semi also. And until like in the last few years, our team has posted the quasar receipt from tier to receive 7.5 or 7.6 also. Now, currently there are only three quasars and are discovered by uh, our, also our collaborators. Uh, okay. So what, what do we would impact in the future? We have like discovered a, Quasar up to 7.5 or 7.6. If you like see the uh, history of the discovery, this is the year of discovery. If you do a simply linear prediction, we, we predict that we can find like Quasar at even further receive the receive eight to nine, maybe 2025 after the launching of next generation telescopes. Okay, let's back to the Quasar, the most distant Quasar and how we found them as, as Dr. Fan and Dr. Yang have mentioned, you need to mine a really large data set in order to find a single quasar. And here is the imaging we used from many different imaging surveys, like this is Panstar imaging survey, which is a, a imaging, optical imaging survey in, in Hawaii. And this is also deeper imaging survey, optical imaging survey from Chile, which is used for the target selecting for the uh, dark energy in, uh, survey instrumentation. And also we used the infrared imaging from the, we call the Waystar telescope also in Chile and also the middle infrared imaging from the space uh, called WISE uh, telescope. And after identify those objects, we observed uh, them with many large telescopes in order to get a good spectrum as the, Dr. Yang has said, uh, using those spectrum, you can measure the black hole mass, you can do many other senses uh, and uh, this is the final the spectra of this uh, most of the distant quasars. Uh, so uh, I probably can briefly introduce how to using the magnesium two emission line, those broad emission line, uh, measure the black hole mass because those emissions are produced by some gas surrounding the black hole. So those gas are like rotating around the black hole, and if if you measure the the profile of this gas, then you can basically know the velocity of those gas, and uh, you can use some. Uh, you know, there's, there are some relation between the radius of the gas and the luminosity of the quasar. Then you have the size, you have the velocity, then you can measure the uh, mass of the central black hole. So here, so this most distant quasar, we call it J0313 minus 1806. It at a relative to uh, 7.6, or it's only 670 million years after the Big Bang. And it hosts a 1.6 billion solar mass black hole. So here, so this plot shows like basically the x axis is the time since Big Bang and the y axis shows the mass of those black holes and the rest, those red points are previous discarded black holes including the Pioneer Anna and the other 7.5 quasars. But this quasar is located here. So it's really the most massive black holes in the early universe and uh, of course the most distant quasar ever known. Uh, so we wanted to start further about this black hole, but first, uh, I wanted to tell you a different feature that we didn't see from previous quasars to the Ponyana. Here you can see the spectra. Like there is a deep here. It's not a small spectra from here to like Lamava, but there is a big trough, two troughs. Uh, here is the zoom in plot, so those A and B labeled. Those are uh, troughs that are caused by the uh, absorption from, we call it so called outflow. And here, so the, in the large, left panel with a, a brief cotton plot to see how those outflows generated. This is a central black hole and the orange part is a crescent disk. Because a crescent disk has so many photons, it has a strong radiation. So it can drive in some, like we call it quasar wind or the quasar outflow. So this wind has a lower temperature than the, than the crescent disk. We observe from this 
lambda site, this, uh, this wind or outflow with a lower temperature can absorb the gas, absorb the light from the aqueous disk. So we can see this absorption trough. And also by measuring the profile and the, like the so-called wind uh, uh, velocity, we can know like how powerful of the outflow. Uh, so why is those outflow are very important? We can see here some movies. The left is so the, let's put the uh, in, into a galaxy. The central is a black hole. And this is the size of the galaxy. Then you can see that this is the wind, the yellow part, and also the jet, which is, uh, if you have the jet, you will have radio emissions. But as I said, not all quasars have such kind of jet. Uh, but most quasars probably have wind, but uh, it's deep, but some uh, wind is strong, some wind is uh, weak. So this quasar has a really strong wind. Uh, those kind of winds, like with a very high velocity, with like up to 20% the speed of light, can push those like gas into the galaxy and to affect the whole galaxy because the scale, the kinematic power is so large, it can affect the whole galaxy. So how 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 is that kind of wind can affect the galaxy? We can see the other movie, uh, like the black hole either to eat those cold gas to grow, right? So after it eat, eating those gas, it will radiate some launch some either jet or wind. This is so the wind, and those gas, those wind or jet will hit the gas in the galaxy, and the and the gas is too hot, it will suppress the star formation because it the gas is too hot, it cannot cool down, cannot collapse to a star, so it will stop the star formation. We call it a negative quasar feedback. But these are all from the theoretical view. Whether this is so it's, it's unclear, but uh, we do have some very few evidence in the low recipe or recipe two also. And as shown here, this color plots to so the star formation region, like where the galaxy has the star, star formation activity, well, those wet contours, so it's where the outflow is. You can see that those, those places with very strong outflow, but you cannot see any star formation, which is a very strong evidence of the quasar outflow or quasar wind that can suppress the star formation in the host galaxy. But what about this high risk quasar? It's in a very early universe. It has to be some difference, maybe because the environment is different and the, uh, it's in a very early universe. Uh, so we wanted to start its star formation, and we targeted this target this object with ALMA. ALMA observes in submillimeter. It can give you the can give you the emission from the dust and the gas in the host galaxy, which directly traces the star formation in the host galaxy. And here is so the dust map, and right here is so the gas map. From both dust map and gas map, we can still see strong emission. And based on those maps, we can measure that the, those galaxy is still producing a lot of new stars. It's like producing new stars at a rate about 200 times that of our Milky Way. Uh, as I said, this quasar has really strong wind, but we are still seeing those uh, very, very strong star formation. So it's just the like a quasar outflow and the star formation releasing is, is complex. It's not like a, I said, just the quasar will quenching or will stop the star formation. And also the gas is all very, very interesting. It's like, uh, in, like in our Milky in our Milky Way, those gas are rotating around the uh, central black hole. So we can see a rotating disk, but the gas in this host galaxy is different. It does not have any other motions. It's basically just a random motions and uh, very high turbulence. Uh, so we need really to more detailed studies of this uh, a uh, system, but uh, limited our current uh, uh, sensitivity of those telescopes and the uh, wavelength range. We really needed to go space, like with the uh, uh, upcoming James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, one advantage of James Webb Space Telescope is it's observing in the infrared, and also it has some new technique like called IFU, integral field units. So it can not only give you a direct image of those emissions, but also it gives you the spectral at each pixel. So you get all the spectrum at each pixel and based on those spectrum, or we call it data cube, you can measure like the, the, the motion of those gas or the kinematic of those, those gas. So you can better understand how those quasar outflow affecting the uh, host galaxy or the star formation in the host galaxy. So this is one thing. Uh, the other thing is, as we said, this black hole 
has the, the black hole in the quasar is really big here. So the black hole mass is about 1.6 billion, and the red dot shows the other quasar, and this is the Pernil Anna. So if how to grow such massive black hole? Those lines draw the growth history, but uh, these lines are have a assumption. Basically, those quasars after formed the seed black hole, it has been growing at the maximum rate. So this is the maximum growth rate. Uh, but one question is how you like how you can provide so much food for this black hole. Like you, you need to provide enough gas to keep the keep the black hole at the maximum accretion rate. Uh, but this depends on like whether those black hole in a different environment also, because you really need a lot of gas surrounding those black hole. So from the theoretical view, people thought like those supermassive black holes has to be a you know, very massive region or overdense region, like as uh, shown in, in this movie. Uh, the, the, the bright part, so basically the mass density is high and the black part, the black part, so the mass density is, is low. So people saw, saw that those quasars has to be growing in a very overdense region or very like within the center of a large scale structure like this, uh, those bright part. And this structure is pretty big but how to prove this, we need observations, right? So these are theoretical view or simulations. And in order to understand how those, whether those quasar do live in this kind of structure, we really needed to uh, study the large scale environment. Uh, but currently limited to the like sensitivity of Hubble Space Telescope and ground-based space telescope. Even we can aim it the, the environment of quasars, but we cannot get the spectra of all those galaxies surrounding those quasars. So you do not know whether those surrounding objects is physically related to the quasars. So hope, but the James Webb Space Telescope will give us opportunity to study this. We have several programs approved uh, in, in cycle one and we will see those data in next year or so. Uh, what we will do is basically pointing the James Webb to those uh, sample of luminous quasars and to get the rest of the, all, all those objects within those field. And then you can basically measure the rest of all those galaxies and to see whether they are physically related to the quasar and to prove whether those quasar really reside in the over dense region and has uh, enough gas supply to, uh, for, to, to the black hole growth. Uh, so here I briefly saw like, uh, simulated observations from James Webb, hopefully we can see such kind of data. Basically each white line is a spectrum of a galaxy within the field I just showed. And we will get all the spectra for all galaxies in this field and to pick up those galaxies related to the quasar and study like their physical connection between the quasar and the uh, surrounding environment. So I will briefly to summarize what we have known about those really massive black holes so basically the first point is those billion solar mass black hole already exist at rest beyond 7.5 or like only 600 million years after the Big Bang. And also the quasar is like, it's already uh, or like a real quasar, it's already like a form of everything. It can produce strong quasar outflows and uh, but how those quasar outflows are affecting the environment and the host galaxy or the star formation in the host galaxy is still unknown. Hopefully in the future, we will know more about the black holes in, in, in sense of both how the quasar feedback regulates the star formation in the quasar host galaxy and also the large scale primordial environment of the early CDCU for massive black holes. So I will stop here and would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. First, I'm going to just thank Dr. Fan, Dr. Yang, and Dr. Wang for that great trio of presentations. And now we're going to open it up to questions. So do we have any questions for the panel? And Mike, you, you go ahead. Um, it's actually towards Dr. Yang, but I, I would imagine all, all three of you folks would be able to answer. So if I understand correctly, we, we don't have enough visual firepower to see more quasars. And if that's the case, why don't we see more? Are we also not looking in the right part of the sky or are there no more uh, 7.5, the ones that are over 7.5 redshift, are there no more out there or 
I, again, I saw the graph going down, but do we expect to see more when we have the, the James Webb out there uh, to be able to focus on different parts of the sky to see more? I mean, is that part of one of our goals when, when we have that out there uh, utilizing your programs to focus on that? Who wants to answer that? Oh, sorry, it's a question for me yeah. or for Faker? Any, anyone well, perhaps, answer it. Anyone yeah, perhaps answer it. Go, ahead. Go, ahead. Line. go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, okay, for it. <laughs> yeah, I, I can. Yeah, I, I can briefly introduce. Uh, basically, currently we are searching nearly all the sky. So we are not an entirely sky. We searching half of the sky, like twenty thousand square degrees. So the James Webb will not help us to find those quasars because the uh, James Webb is a big telescope, right? It has a small field view, so mm -hmm. you can. You, you only target those specific objects. It's not doing the all sky survey. Uh, so that, that's why James Webb will not help us. But the upcoming other space telescopes like the Euclid mission and also the Ruman Space Telescope, the formerly called uh, W first, those telescopes will mapping like a large area of the sky with much deeper image. And this will give us chance to find more quasars at such high resolution. But the problem is actually it's high. I maybe I look for quasar for too long now. the The problem is high resolution quasar is the future is not very bright, because you're looking at really the earliest objects in the universe. At some point, you're going to run out of objects, because that's when the first objects show up. And as the Dr. Wang said, we have already looked at half of the sky, and. There are not much more sky to look at, actually. You can double that. Well, you can't because the Milky Way is on along sort of blocking a lot of the lot of view. But there, we can push to rush of eight or maybe rush of nine. But I think that's about it. Uh, then you're you're then you will need a bigger universe to find more of them. Unfortunately, we don't have one. I have a question. Um, if you can hear me. Yeah, please go on. Yeah. Um, so are the quasars you look you are looking at since I mean we have to see quasars that are so old and um, from like earlier in the universe, are these are the quasars you can see similar to quasars that are closer to us, like younger ones? Uh Basically, yes. They're the uh, the spectrum of the quasar, spectra of these quasars don't really look very different when you look at their earlier ones or look at more recent ones. That's part of the puzzle. We actually don't quite understand why they don't show a lot of uh, evolution in their in, in the property of these objects. Um, we have theories, but it's not it's, it's somewhat a surprise. But the, to the first order, they look very similar. Uh, if I show you the spectrum of the very first quasar, the most, the, the, actually also the closest quasar we know, which is a redshift of 0.1. Compare that to the spectrum of say, the, the object we just, we just showed you. Uh, if you don't know the redshift, you just shift it into the same, just de-redshift it, they look exactly the same. That's part of the, part of the thing that surprises of why Quasars don't seem to care which uh, cosmic age they're living in. Thank you. Next question. Do we only see quasars that are pointed towards us or in our direction? Uh, so uh, how big an angle that you can see quasar is sort of a open question. I think maybe uh, you probably can see a quasar not, not sort of blocked by the dust around it. Um, of the order of half or maybe 30% of the case, uh, the other maybe half or more of the quasars, sort of, you probably don't see it is because there are a lot of dust and gas sort of blocking the view, at least in the optical wavelengths that we have observed. Uh, but they're not like really, a, I mean, most of, the, most of the radiation you see them are not from the jets that you have to point towards you. It just, you have to be, coming from an angle that is not blocked by these uh, so-called dust holes. So you'll probably see half of them 
or maybe 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 less than half, but not not like one percent, maybe 20 percent, 20, 30 percent, depending on exactly which model we're using. Next question. Um, I a question Dr. About, um, yeah. Go, go I'm sorry. Go ahead. Ah, I had a question about uh, how do you really distinguish between a lensed quasar versus a uh, quasar that you know we're we're just seeing without any lensing effects? Wouldn't that throw off the the measurements in terms of redshift and uh, and then distance measurements? So lensing doesn't affect redshift. It does affect how bright the object is. It doesn't. It doesn't shift the wave lines of the lines. Uh, I mean, the the key of uh, telling whether it's lensed or not. If it's strongly lensed, if it means it's lensed magnified by a lot, then you always see two Im more than two images. Sometimes three. Sometimes four. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the images, the separation of images, is very small, because essentially, the, when you when you lens by a single galaxy. The separation of these images is sort of of the order of half arc second or one arc second or sometimes even less. Uh, so typically, ground-based image is not quite enough to resolve it. So when we have a suspicion of the object is lensed but don't quite resolve it, we have to go to like Hubble to do, to or using adaptive optics, for example, to to really get to instead of one arc second images, we get to 0.1 arc second image. Then we can see it. So you always have to see the multiple images in order to confirm its lens. Next question. Dr. Yang, um, you were going to tell us how you got the name for your quasar in Hawaiian. Did I miss that or did you say it yet? Uh, yes, that quasar got a Hawaiian name uh, because it was first discovered with Germini. Because Germini is in Hawaii on, to on top of Mauna Kea. So after we discovered that quasar, so uh, there is a program uh, in, I think it's a, a astronomical community in Hawaii. Uh, there, two years ago in the summer, they give this quasar a name in, in Hawaii. So that gives a very interesting means of this quasar. Yeah. yeah, it's sort of a collaboration between the observatories in Mauna Kea and the local schools, the science teacher in the schools. So they actually, I think they, in the summer, they run these programs of a bunch of interesting discoveries. And then the Nevada science teachers uh, from local community to talk about it and then come up with meaningful names for the community, sort of as a way of engaging the community or the local community to, uh, to the discoveries. Um, I mean, it's the same program that names this, uh, uh, that, that uh, out of the solar system object or uh, more and more, uh, more and all, and all the others, it's, it's the same program that, that did this. And I think they also gave the name to the M87 first black hole image, right? They have a Hawaiian name as well. So came from the same, come, come from the same group of people. I gotta say, that's so cool. <laughs> Next question. So, hi, I have a general question that's not really related to your talk, I'm afraid. So maybe you you will decide not to answer it. But you know, so much of what we do when we're working on these types of questions and the theories that are put forth and that you test are based on our understanding of physics. And I'm just wondering, you know, I, you probably everybody's probably heard about the the recent work uh, with a muon that has a wobble in the magnetic field that seems to call into question some of the the thinking that we have on, on the immutable laws of physics. And, and I know it's still unproven at this point and, and requires more confirmation before we do that, but how would that affect these types of studies? And, and does that really, would that really have an effect on your ability to, to make some of these predictions? That's a really good question. And it's a deep one because I don't know the answer. Every time, I mean, I'm a cosmologist and uh, every time I think about these things, I get very uneasy because uh, it's, it's way, it's, I mean, we, we already know standard model of physics doesn't work, right? I mean, doesn't work precisely. And this uh, uh, N minus two muon thing is just another example of it. And as a cosmologist, uh, I, we sometimes say that we have a beautiful model of explaining from the big bang to now and well, the expansion and everything. On the other hand, when you look at, we have all seen this pie chart of the constituents of the universe before we have 5% of the, 
matter we understand, we have 25% dark matter, we have 70% dark energy. You ask me what they are, we don't know what they are. So we're, I think it's sort of half full, half empty, depending on how you see it. On one hand, we have this nice model that seems to explain the observations. On the other hand, we have 95% missing components. So there must be something new out there. Uh, exactly how they affect our understanding of the specific objects. I think from the perspective of just explaining these observations fitting into the current models, they're probably okay because we don't have to know what dark matter is to explain these observations. On the other hand, I'm sure when we find out what they are, uh, there will be fundamental change of how we interpreted these objects to the way that we just can't figure out. We just can't, and I mean, I, I don't know what, how things will turn out when we finally figure out what dark matter is. So we, we were, we're working with the, in this current framework happily, but there are always something in the back of our mind that uh, things can be completely wrong. I mean, we never quit to try to test general relativity, right? And a lot of the new observations are testing general relativity in a way that different from before, for example, large, just much larger scale than people had before. And hopefully there will be a breakthrough because, uh, yeah, that's the only way to make progress. I want to jump in. I got to say, this is a crazy exciting time to be an astronomer, knowing that there is so much stuff to learn that we don't know about what is dark matter, dark energy. So um, with that, I'll ask for the next question. I have a quick question for Dr. Yang, uh, if she has time. I remember that um, you were saying that your observations support the direct collapse model of the supermassive black hole formation in the early universe. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what that model says about how supermassive black holes actually form. Uh, yeah, uh, actually I can show you a slice that will directly answer your questions. Um, yeah, so can you see my slides? Yes. Yeah, here this, uh, uh, very famous and uh, the simple discretion about the three models or three models I described before. So we can see the middle one. This one is the direct claps. So uh, the difference between direct claps and the other is just uh, this one is uh, uh, just as, a, as it's a name, it direct claps from unstable gas uh, into just direct claps into a uh, uh, just the, the unstable gas from uh, from a massive uh, star and then uh, the core direct collapse into a very massive black hole. So in this model, it can form a very massive, it's around 1 million or uh, 0.1 um, million to 1 million um, um, solar mass. Uh, the other, we can see the other two, the upper and the bottom, they're from star or from star cluster uh, first. And then uh, this one is a star uh, remnant, so just a few hundred um, solar mass and the black hole and the star cluster and just the uh, gas form a star dense cl star cluster and then it starts uh, inside the cluster the only collision and star merges then we can get a uh, um, massive uh, black hole is one thousand so direct clouds is the direct clouds from the unstable uh, unstable gas and to a massive star and the core direct clouds so it's it's the most massive C black hole model. But I should say, uh, yeah, it's just a theoretical model. Uh, we, we don't have any observational evidence to constrain such model. There are some suggestions that uh, some observations of the uh, Brad CR7, uh, maybe the evidence, but yeah, it's still unclear, yeah. Great question. Um, I have a general comment. I noticed that uh, there was, uh, in several of the charts they made reference to using the data from the upcoming James Webb Telescope, which is going to be launched in October of this year. And I wanted to ask this kind of leading question, which is, will you be using the mid-IR instrument data? Because next month, our speaker is Michael, Dr. Michael Ressler from James Webb Space Telescope. He, he's going to be coming here and giving a briefing. And I want to invite all of you, including our new friends here at Stewart Observatory, to come join us yes we will we will be using the mid instrument we'll actually be using all the instruments on on james webb to, to observe these quasars uh, all four of them i believe um, and, and mid infrared is important and you'll probably hear from uh from him later on that uh, because it's probing the dusty universe and the problem with these quasars or is that they're surrounded by these uh 
by 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 dust. So in order to understand these quasar properties, you have to observe the mid infrared in order to see the dust emission, to build dust models, and see how dust get heated up and all that. So we will be using a mid instrument for sure. Thank you. Next question for our panel. I have, I have a quick one, hopefully. All right, Jerry. Oh, I didn't want to. Go ahead, Jerry. Okay. So um, amateurs like to get out year after year after year and take pictures of the same things. Is there any value at all in measuring uh, a magnitude of an optical uh, quasar year after year to determine if there are variations in magnitude that would be interesting to track? They're hugely yeah. important. Uh, Figo, you want to take on this one? Is there? Yeah, so sorry. So the variation of the magnetic phase is very important, and that's why the Rubin, the Rubin telescope will do, like uh, it will scan the sky again and again to get the light curves of all kinds of objects, including those quasars. So the variation of those quasar lights can basically tell you like how the accretion disk works, because those lights are like most of the light we see from a quasar is come from the accretion disk. If there are some variation, that means there are some changes in the accretion disk. Either like the accretion disk is not stable or there are something like maybe a star run into the accretion disk cause some so-called TDE environment, TDE environment. So basically if you can monitor those quasars like again and again, you will gain many insights about how the central part works like how the increasing disk works and how it's producing those lights. So if we were doing that measurement consistently and tracking it, who would we submit that data to? Uh, who would take amateur data is really my question. That's a big question, I think. Like, I don't know the answer. Because yeah. I... <laughs> oh, Jerry, let me jump in. Um, we are, you know, doing a current project with the NASA test uh, program, um, doing exoplanet light curves. That's done with um, Scott Dixon and our voice group in in the astronomy club. So yeah, I'm but, familiar uh, with that. I'm familiar with those a, guys and what they do. Help them to make it policy. scientific quality. You have to do a lot of calibration work. That's just, I mean, there's just a huge amount of that kind of not time at the scope work that has to be done to make it useful. Correct. But what magnitudes are you talking about for your observations, Dr. Wang? Uh, it, it's it's like basically invisible in those small scopes. Like it's like 20 is magnitude in the infrared. And if you talk about the optical, it's totally invisible, like fingers yeah, well, 25. For... Well, for the lower red, yeah. for lower redshift, things are better, but still, most of the interesting things are done at sort of the 17, 18 magnitude level, I believe. Uh, what wavelengths? Right one. Um, visible is fine. These are for more local optics. Um, I thought I, I believe they are amateur work looking at. Um, usually, it's probably not quite deep enough or precise enough for some of the more subtle quasar work, but I thought some of the amateur work actually were quite useful in monitoring a group of objects called blazers. These are objects that are brighter and are much more variable because essentially you're looking sort of down, down to the barrel of the jet and things vary more, just a lot more there. Uh, and some of these things are much brighter. I don't know what, who do you report to, but I recall they are, they are very useful sort of amateur work on, on monitoring blazers at least. It would be the AAVSO, I believe. I've got a question, I, um, and this is a, a, probably a dumb question, but, I, but these have grown so rapidly in just a few hundred million years. What do you think, what, what do you project, what are they now? Are, are they, are, do they continue to grow at that rate? Well, you, you saw from Dr. Wang's uh, presentation that that quasar is blowing, get, blowing wind already. So yeah. most likely at some point, those wind is gonna stop it from growing. What they are now, uh, I think the best example is that black on M87. They're pretty much what they are now, I believe. Okay. They right. are, they are going to, we don't know exactly, of course, when M87 black hole stopped growing, but it certainly stopped growing a while ago. 
and the galaxy stopped forming star a while ago. And that's what we expect most of the quasars will be coming up today. Okay. I have a Thanks. question relating directly to the blazars that you just mentioned or the, the main beam. Has there been uh, any research done as far as, um, I know you said we still need data to research it further, but between it being more like a particle accelerator or potentially more laser-like because it's so concentrated? Uh, these are particle accelerators. Is, is, is there uh, any research that you could potentially direct me to that you know of? Uh, or, or what I should look into? I think if you pick up any, um, I, can, I, can, I can think about the textbook, but um, I don't remember the author of the textbook right now. They're describing like a blazer phenomena. But if you just look for uh, the, the general textbook for actual, uh, or you know, papers about blazers or active galactic nuclei, you will find those. Thank you. Next question for our panel. Are quasars from the early universe distributed evenly in the sky? Uh, that's a very good question. So as I, as I mentioned, like uh, those quasars has to be formed in a really big structure because it, it needs like uh, food to grow, right? So like uh, those last good structure is not uniform. Like if you're talking about like very early universe, like after the Big Bang, it's kind of uniform, but it has some fluctuations. So all those quasars sort of form in those fluctuation part. It's like uh, several sigma like outer layers. So whether it's evenly distributed on the sky, I mean, if you have a large number of quasars like in the local universe, it's roughly uniform, but it has some clustering, like uh, many quasars cluster to each other and some, some part of the sky is void. There's no such kind of structure. It totally depends on the, basically the last school structure of the universe. So basically, the, 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 I mean, I think the short answer is it's kind of a uniform if you're looking at the off sky, but if you're looking into a small part of the sky, it basically has some clustering structure, like some part of over, like you have more quasars than the other part, but the, like if you're talking about the whole sky, it's kind of uniform, but it has fluctuations. I, I was wondering, uh, can I ask a question? Uh, how, how much lead time do you need to, like, to have access to these optical and radio telescopes? How much, how many years or months do you have to apply in advance? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Like all the astronomers need to write proposals to get the telescope time, right? So, we usually like write many proposals. Like there are two seasons. Uh, like for example, like this weekend is a deadline for the Alma proposal. So we are writing the proposal now, and usually we can get like a few nights, eight to ten meter telescope per semester, like uh, up to ten nights per year. And for smaller telescope, we can get more. But for Space telescope is harder, right? Because the uh, competition is like stronger. So you we, we can get some orbits like per year. It depends, depends on like your proposal. Yeah. Yeah. So usually it's either twice a year or once a year to call these proposals. Uh, and of course, depending on the that telescope, whether it's your it's your national facility, then is open to the entire country. There's some international facility open to the entire world. There's some facility that only certain institutions have, then we can get it easier. Otherwise, national facilities usually are talking about one out of four, one out of five kind of rate of uh, getting success on these on these things. So there's only five proposal to get one. That's a hard game, usually. Good luck. <laughs> um, I, so I have a question. I'm going to jump in. Um, since you're looking at these bright quasars across the galaxy and you're looking through um, you, uh, neutral clouds and things like that, it's my understanding that there are uh, forest absorption lines that shift um, as the universe, they shift in wavelength as the universe is stretching. And, uh, and I wanted to ask, does your data get used to help resolve the 
tension in the Hubble constant between the Planck data and the supernova data, because it's kind of, you know, it's not either of those. Our, the quasar data themselves, I mean, our quasar data don't, but quasars do have a very important usage, which we mentioned, gravitational lensing, right? So lensing data from quasars, not from these very distant ones, a little bit closer ones, are really important actually in playing a very important role in that game. Uh, the reason is uh, the um, gravitational lensing, of course, if you, because you see multiple images from the same quasar, and as the quasar light pass through different sort of part, when it bend differently for these different images, uh, they pass through different space. So they have a light uh, sort of a time delay between these uh, different uh, components. And we met, just mentioned earlier that quasars vary. So that means different components of these lens quasars vary at different time. And exactly how much, how different those variation is, is dependent on Hubble constant, exactly explain the proportion of the Hubble constant. So by monitoring these lensed quasars, you can get a completely independent way of measuring Hubble constant that doesn't depend on Cepheid variable calibration. It doesn't depend on CMB coming from the Planck. So it's a completely independent way of, a very clean way of doing it. Uh, people couldn't do it before because model of these lenses is not easy and monitor is not easy. But finally, people are making enough progress of these lens quasar monitoring to directly matter Hubble constant that way. Um, and the results so far seem to be closer to the Cepheid results and the Planck results. Cool. But that, that one still have a rather large error bar on it because there are not a lot of systems that you can monitor like this, uh, but the error bar is getting smaller very quickly. So I suspect that it's gonna, gonna play a very important role. Um, actually, this particular thing sort of connected all the things we talked about, quasar variability, lensing, cosmology, and everything. So it's, it's a neat way of using Quasar to do cosmology. Cool. Next question for the panel. Uh, I have a question. I like to make these people uh, human again. They're so fascinating. And if I was in charge of Hubble, I, I would uh, black out a whole bunch of time for you guys. But um, sorry about that. Anyways, oh. Um, uh, um, Dr. Uh, Wang, um, your uh, parents, what do they think about your uh, study of uh, cosmology? Sorry, I, I, I didn't quite get the question. Can, can I repeat the last sentence? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what your parents think about your uh, field of uh, study, cosmology. My parents? or Yeah, your parents, do, do they understand what you're talking about on quasars? Uh, be our fun group to hear. Sponsors, I should say our, our group sponsors a whole bunch of work where we're so proud to help give young students mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, foot up in the astronomy direction and many of their parents have no understanding or experience with cosmology or any of this like and so they have very interesting reactions so he's asking about how your react your parents reacted when you told them I want to be a cosmologist yeah, that's a really good question. I think it's like, it's very important question for like uh, future young people, right? So my parents, they do not understand the, the cosmologist, but they know I'm doing science. And they know like science is important for the development of all those technologies and all the like uh, cultural involvement and all that kind of stuff. So, so they fully support like I'm doing science, like, they don't care about whether it's cosmology or like physics or other things, but they just think of doing the science, like science investigation is important. Sometimes I explain some like simple stuff to them, but yeah, they understand some simple questions, but not totally like what is cosmology doing. Yeah. They're just proud. <laughs> Next question for the panel. Okay, then I'll toss in another question. Um, is your work ever used to, to calibrate the CMB? I know that there's a lot of work has to be put into pulling out corrupting sources of, of uh, contributions to the cosmic microwave background. And I didn't know whether, since you're doing things that do measure intervening materials, 
to, is there a role where they use, I don't know, your measurements to determine gas density or plasma density or something like that across these vast distances that you're measuring? I mean, there aren't many people that measure stuff that far. Not directly, but there's a really interesting connection between what we're doing and the CMB. Uh, remember the word that made me talk about reionization, right? That's at the time when the when when the light from first stars and galaxies is uh, sort of a ionized the gas, and CMB is basically light sort of traveling from after the universe become not ionized. When you have ionization in the gas, uh, as we saw in the quasars, that you can, we can measure it, uh, the electrons basically ionize gas. So the electrons, the electrons are going to scatter the CMB photons. This scattering is doing cause trouble for the CMB measurement, cause pretty significant trouble actually. So you have to measure that correctly. So in the standard model of the Planck observations, there are these parameters that tell you how all the universes, how much dark matter is, and the geometry universes. There's one parameter that is completely not cosmological, it's completely astrophysical. That is how much ionized gas there is in the universe, basically. That is going to scatter the CMB photons and, and make the signal weaker. And that is that particular number is related to this reionization, related to this hot gas we see in the quasar spectrum. So our, our data uh, better be consistent with that number. And so far it's consistent. They're not directly um, informing you uh, measurements, but if if the, the 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 electron measurement in the CMB is different from the quasar measurement, then we're in trouble. And actually, 15 years ago, those two numbers were different, and there it took a while to figure out what's going on. What's going on was actually, as you said, the CMB calibration is not quite right. And when the CMB calibration got right, then those two numbers are consistent. So it's an important sort of a independent check of whether we got CMB right. It's from from these uh, hot electron sort of uh, experiment that CMB people are doing. Okay. Another question for the panel? Okay, I think we've gotten through most of the questions. This will be the last chance. Anyone speak now. Uh, I wanted to make a comment. Uh, someone was asking about blazers and, and, uh, and where you can find, I have this book, The Cosmos. It's a- uh, Okay. It's a fifth edition, Pasushov from Filipenko, and on page 541 and 542, there's a reference to blazers. It's, it's a 19, 2019 astronomy, college astronomy book. So it's called Cosmos. So thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Last opportunity for question. Going once. I wanted to ask a very basic question. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, just wanted to ask when you're talking about ionized gas, what gas are we talking about? Hydrogen and helium? Because there wasn't much. Yeah, uh, hydrogen, helium. Hydrogen, helium. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, these are pristine gas that coming directly from the Big Bang. There are a the tiny bit of other stuff that galaxies sort of uh, injected, got into them, but uh, almost not, it's like 99% hydrogen and helium. So are we able to make some estimates regarding the ratio of hydrogen and helium with, uh, with quasar data? Uh, so there's not much of helium you can do in, um, in, in quasar spectro spectroscopy. So not directly. The quasar data are important actually to measure in terms of how the Big Bang make elements to measure a deuterium, sort of hydrogen too. Uh, that one you can measure because that that ratio is actually quite related to uh, to the to essentially how big band nuclear synthesis happened and that used to be not quite anymore but used to be a very important field of using quasar to do it. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, with that, I want to thank our panel of uh, Dr. Fang, Dr. Yang, and Dr. Wang. Um, we very much enjoyed your talk and um, I want to invite you all back next month if you'd like to come to an, any of our future presentations and uh, if you're busy defending your thesis or putting in for time on a telescope, um, you can maybe watch our uh, presentations on, on our YouTube channel. So with that, I will call the end of the uh, 11th of May.
or I'm sorry, it's not the 11th of May, the 19th of April um, San Diego Astronomy Association meeting. Thank you all. Thank you. It's been fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This was awesome. Thank you. It's very Thank cool. You. Very, very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Very cool. Bye.